I had eight brothers and sisters, you know, that just didn't happen. In our family, we licked our food so no one else would eat it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you did not get in my space. In my space, I, I remember there were people everywhere in my family. I loved to get alone and worship the Lord, and I'd get my guitar, and I could not find anywhere to go with my guitar and just worship God by myself without a sibling there. Everywhere I went, I, I even went on the roof one time and my sister was up there tanning. I'm like, what is going on? There's people everywhere in this house. I finally climbed a tree. There were people walking by and heard something on the sidewalk. And I saw this one person looks up and there I am up in a tree playing guitar. I'm, How's it going? Just worshiping the Lord. I understand being packed and crowded, but we'll, we'll get some more room here. Uh, I preached last week in Burleson a message that I've heard so many reports, people telling me, man, I've heard a lot about that message, and I'm going to preach the same message here just because I believe it will bless you, but it's seven truths that saved my biscuits. That's the title of it. And if you know, what do you mean saved your biscuits? I had somebody ask, what, what are biscuits? I'm like, you don't know what biscuits are, man? Come on. Biscuits, we were talking about them earlier. Red Lobster has these Cheddar Bay biscuits. Have you ever had those? Those are good. That's God's will for your life. I'm telling you. <laughs> Carol, they're so good. Ashley learned how to make them at home. Get, her, get with her if you want to know how to make those at home. There's a way to do it. But, but biscuits represent something good that God has for your life or just life, okay? That's your biscuits. You want them to save your biscuits, not burn your biscuits, right? And there are times in life where I almost missed out on God's best for me. It's like I almost short-circuited or stopped something that God had in store for me or that would have helped me. And I thought, oh, man, I almost missed out. Thank God he saved my biscuits. And these are seven truths that God used to help me. And uh, one I know specifically, it was like I had been serving the Lord for a while. If you serve the Lord for a while, you just sometimes have a place or reach a place where you just kind of hit a wall or things get stagnant. It's almost like like in every uh, walk with God, you have that honeymoon stage to where you're just like, oh, I love Jesus. I love this church. Everything is awesome. And then and it's almost like a childhood or baby stage too, to where you're just like, oh, the baby's so cute. It's wonderful. I love it. And as they get to a teenage stage, sometimes you can get to a place where it's kind of like, I don't know if I like being here. Teenagers can be that way. We call it teenage angst in our family, right? And so I tell Samuel, I said, don't get that way. And he won't. Thank God. He stays sweet. But sometimes teenagers can get to this place where you're just like, oh, I don't know. And you're growing. It's a transition. And the hardest time in life is at the transition phase. It's the same with skateboarding, right? It, where you're skateboarding, you're dropping in. I've got a couple of skater friends here. You're dropping in. You, you hit that transition. That's when you're going to fall, generally speaking. And so it's a hard time. You're going from one plane to another plane. And when you're going from the horizontal earthly realm to the spiritual realm, it's that transition sometimes that gets you. And so I want to encourage you, number one truth that saved my biscuit during that transition time is serve God from a want to, not a have to. Serve him from a want to, not a have to. You have to press beyond the have to. Oh, I have to go to church. I understand that. I grew up in this very building as a kid going to church. And I remember my mom saying, hey, you have to go to church. Why? Well, because we've got women's aglow meetings. I've got to be there. You've got, we've got this wedding shower. We've got this baby shower. My parents were pastors. I had to be at everything. And so for a long time, I started getting to the have to. I have to go. And then we had vacation Bible school. And I thought, why would they put vacation and school in the same sentence? <laughs> they don't go together. Vacation Bible school? What? So I had to be here for that. But then my dad said, we're going to start a school. We had a school right here in this very room. We had, my desk was right over there against that wall. We had these big dividers that we folded down these desks, had these little cubicles. And so there were kids all in here. A lot of y'all, some of y'all remember that being here and seeing those desks. And uh, so we went to school here and it made me realize, you know, now we're here like every day. Why are we even, why do we even have a house? We don't even go there. 
We're in church all the time. And I understand the have to. Sometimes you just have to press beyond that. But then I ended up getting a job as a pastor and being called to ministry. I felt like that's what God's called me to do. So then I start working at a church at 20 years old in Fort Worth. It was Calvary Cathedral International. I worked under Pastor Bob Nichols for 24 years. I was on staff there. And it was great, but I had to press beyond the have to to where it's not I have to go preach, I have to go to work, it's I get to and I want to. And hopefully you can tell I love my job. I love being here. I want to be here. And so I would like for people to want to be in this place. But sometimes you have to press beyond the have to. There were times and have been times where I didn't want to, honestly. But it still works. It still does good. Even if you don't want to read your Bible, I encourage you to read it anyway. And you'll press beyond that uh, to the want to phase. And, and again, my wife and I, we got married, had our anniversary, our honeymoon. The honeymoon was awesome. And then there were some times there where it, weren't, it was a challenge. We had to press beyond. I'm sure she had to be married to me. <laughs> but so, hey, let me tell you, there's power in that. And you have to be married to that person. It'll keep your marriage. And trust me, it'll come back around to where then you want to. And you're like, hey, if, and we just celebrated our anniversary uh, 17 years uh, this week, and it's been awesome. Uh, that's nothing, though, compared to Jack and Judy. How many years are y'all celebrating Wednesday? 65. 65 years of marriage. Praise God. And I'm sure Judy always wanted to be married to Jack. She never had the have to. See? <laughs> She always wanted to, right? After 65 years, I'll tell you what, you can learn some things. Happy anniversary, guys. We're so excited. Thank you all for going through the half two times and uh, getting there. But anyway, I, I think sometimes with God, when we have to do things for him, imagine how your spouse would feel if you said, oh, I have to go hang out with my wife. Or your kids, if you said, oh, I have to go to my kids' game or my grandkids. Oh, I have to take care of them. You know, that kind of hurts their heart a little bit. I mean, don't you want to? And ultimately, I realize I'm hurting or grieving the Holy Spirit when I say, I have to go to church. Or I have to spend time in prayer. No, I want to. And really, if you think about it, in your heart, you really do want to. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be here right? Even in the have to, you think, you know, you could not have a spouse. You could not have a husband or not have a wife or you could not have a child, but, but you want to. You do it because you want to and you love them. Even through the hard times, it's the same way in the walk with God and that where you say, you know what? I want to serve the Lord really deep down. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes to serve God with joy. You might as well put a smile on your face and say, all right, I'm going to remember what it was like when I was first saved. I'm going to remember what it was like when I was first married. And when I first had kids, we used to sit there and just stare at my little son. When he was born, I'd just be like, whoa. His face, he'd just be making all these weird faces. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. I took pictures of every face. I still got them. And so sometimes you realize you're not taking pictures like you used to. You need to do that. Again, value things like you used to, and you'll watch that joy will come back that you maybe used to have, or that at one time your walk with the Lord was so powerful or so wonderful. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, it's talking about the woman who came and broke her alabaster box at the feet of Jesus. She wanted to do that. She didn't have to. It wasn't a requirement of the law. Nobody did that. But yet she took her precious ointment and she came and she broke it and she anointed Jesus with that. And then went so far as to wipe in his feet with her hair and her tears. I mean, that's, that's pretty committed. I'm like, wow, you wouldn't do that unless you really wanted to. And that's where we need to be to a place where, God, I really want to serve you. But in Luke 7, 47, Jesus said, he's telling the people that were there. He said, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loveth little. you got to realize, how much have you been forgiven by Jesus? Think about that. I think I've lived a pretty good life, pretty clean. I'm 
I never smoked a cigarette. I never drank a drop of alcohol. I never, I cussed one time when I was 10 and never did it again. I hated it. I felt terrible. <laughs> My brother was like, hey, don't you wish it was okay to cuss? And I'm like, never really thought of it. He's like, let's just say every cuss word we know. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. And we're walking in the field over at Pecan Plantation, and my, and my brother just starts calling blankety blank rock, you blankety blank bush. And I'm, so I'm starting cussing. We're cussing everything, saying every word we knew, and some I didn't know he did. I felt terrible. I thought, after that, I thought, why are we cussing God's creation? This is, stuff, this is the stuff the Lord has made. And we're cussing out his creation. <laughs> I never did it again. I never said another cuss word in my life. And as good as I think that I might have been, and I said, this is the only woman I've ever been with and will be, in Jesus' name, amen? She said, that's right. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you that I fall so far short of what it takes for salvation that I can't even begin to, to say enough thank you, thank you, thank you to Jesus for what he's done for me. He saved me. He delivered me. Because, again, as good as you've been, you're not good enough to get to heaven. It takes perfection to get to heaven. And who of us is perfect? None of us, right? And so, again, I say, okay, Lord, I am thankful because of what you, and I don't have to serve you. I get to serve you because you've loved me and forgiven me of so much. I've fallen so far short. Number two, truth that saved my biscuit. Develop your own walk with God, not based on anybody else. Okay? Not based on anybody else. Most of the times in church, again, I've grown up in church my whole life. I've seen it where you'll have, many times in a relationship, you'll have a godly one and a worldly one. And many times in marriage or even friendships or whatever, there'll be a godly person and a worldly person. And what'll happen a lot of times is if something happens to that godly person, the other person will fall away from Christ or will turn away from God or whatever, and they'll fall away because their relationship with God was based upon the godly person in the relationship. And so I encourage people always, you have a relationship with God for yourself, not based on anybody else. I'll say this to young people. Young people, have your own walk with God. And I'll say this to our young people, this is not your parents' church, okay? This is not your grandparents' church. This is your church, amen? And, and you serve the Lord yourself. And so I'm not just your parents' pastor. I'm your pastor. And, and so you can, if you need something, you can let me know. I'll be glad to help you or minister to you any way I can because I understand your relationship is not based on your parents because if it is, when you get out from your parents' house, you're not going to serve the Lord anymore. Why? Because that was mom and dad's church. Well, that was mom and dad's gospel. That was their belief. What is your belief? You have to say, as for me and my room, we'll serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. It's important to do that. And so, again, I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking you young people to be official members. Go to Connect class. Do whatever you need to do to say, hey, I'm a member of this church myself. And uh, I remember being uh, tempted when I left home for the first time in my life. I was 20 years old, had my own apartment. I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, and the thought to me came... I can do anything that I want to. Whoa. 20 years old. I was out of the house. I can see any movie that mom and dad said I can't watch, whatever. I can go anywhere, do whatever. And, this, and all of a sudden, I just started to worship God. I lifted my hands. I said, Lord, I want to serve you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thanking God because he put that in me. It's not something natural. The nature of man is to want to go evil or to want to turn bad or to want to go towards sin. That's the nature of man. It's carnal. But yet, if you have a desire for the things of God, it's only because God put that on the inside of you. And so begin to thank him and say, Lord, I thank you that you've given me that desire and that hunger for the things of God to want to serve you. And now, for the first time in my life, I'm serving you because I want to, not because I have to. 
and I've got my own relationship with you. And in Matthew 24, 37, it tells a story about what the, what the end of the times is going to be like. I've seen this many times. I've gone out on the streets and led thousands and thousands of people to the Lord one-on-one -on -one many times in the streets. Although generally speaking, very rarely do you just meet one person on the street. There's usually two. I can't explain it. It seems like people just tend to hang out in groups of two. It's the nature of people, I guess. And so I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and said, hey, has anybody ever told you God loves you? He's got a great plan for your life. And I start to talk to them and then, and then they want to receive Christ. And I say, if you would like to receive the gift that God has for you, pray this prayer with me. The one will walk away and one will stay. One will leave and one will receive. That's the way it is 90% of the time. It's amazing. Sometimes they'll both pray. But, and sometimes they'll both walk away. But for the most part, one will leave and one will receive. But look here in, in the book of Matthew 24, 37. It's talking about the rapture, right? Jesus talking here. He said, but as the days of Noah, you know the story of Noah and the ark, how the world was flooded. It said, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. For it is in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They were living their lives just party, hardy, marty and didn't care. It was everything's great and there's no end of anything. And we're just going to live forever and just do whatever we want to do. And uh, again, if you do some research on that, marrying and giving in marriage, it wasn't just talking about physical relationship. It was talking about same-sex marriage, which is interesting. As in the days of Noah, so it will it be in these last days. And we're seeing that in these last days where it's like this huge thing about marriage and same-sex marriage. But it said they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to hit people out of the blue. Then shall two be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. You don't know what hour that's going to be. But it, one will be taken, one, one will receive, and one will leave. And I've seen this so many times. There are people in your life that are assigned by the devil to distract you and to get you away from God. That's their only purpose for being in your life. And you've got to watch that. I see that too many times. And I say, okay, this person, their mission, they are being used by Satan to be that person to try to distract or guard or to keep you away from God. And when Jesus shows up, that person will leave. Why? Because they, they can't take the heat, so to speak, and they have to get out of the kitchen. And so you have to realize, wait a second, is this person speaking to me from God? Are they a blessing from God or are they a messenger from Satan sent to distract or to keep me from being born again or receiving Christ? And it's good to recognize that. So you have to have a relationship with God, not based on anybody else but yourself. And you know, if you really love and care that person for that person that's worldly, the most the best thing you can do for them is for you to serve God because you'll be like an anchor to your soul, uh, so to speak, or to that family. You know, a lot of people, even with your family, you say, well, I love my family so much, I can't leave them. Okay, well, you can at least serve God and say, well, as for me, I'm going to serve God. You do what you want to, but if they go off and be crazy, live life, get in trouble, hurt, whatever that happens, you stay there with Christ and watch what will happen. They'll come back to you. But if, you, if they leave and then you leave Christ and God and go out in the world to be with them, there's nothing to come back to. You're both lost. Okay, so I encourage you do that. And somebody in your family is going to serve God and, and stay right with God. It might as well be you, right? It might as well. Somebody has to. Number three point, don't make excuses for backsliding. Three things so far that have saved my biscuits. Don't make excuses for backsliding. You know, storms come and go in life, and I see this so many times, and some of you have probably seen this too, where people that were, they were in church, they were serving God, everything was going great, and then a storm came in their life. 
the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, someone, something happened, they got offended or something, and then all of a sudden they said, oh, well, I may as well go back to drinking, smoking, partying, whatever, living life however I lived it, and going back to the devil, back to Satan. And so they'll leave and use an excuse to backslide. But I have seen, too, where storms in life will really only push you in the direction that your sails are already set. If your sails are set toward God, a storm can come in your life, the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, whatever, and it will actually draw you closer to God. So don't use it as an excuse and say, well, that's why I fell away, or, well, there's too many hypocrites in the church, and that's why I don't go anymore. You know, I always figured, wait a second, if a, if a hypocrite comes between you and God, then that hypocrite is closer to God than you are. Why is that? Why is it you left and the hypocrite's still there? Come on. Don't you be the one to leave. You get closer to God. Don't let a hypocrite keep you from serving the Lord. You hold steady. And watch. God will take care of business, right? And even if not... God can use those sandpaper people in our life to help finish us, so to speak, and to polish us. Those people that we think, oh, I don't like them. I'm not going to church because I don't like that person. They're, I don't like them there. Hey, God may be using that person to rub you the wrong way because you've got some rough edges you need smoothed. And if you can handle that, you can handle anything, and you're going to be a vessel unto honor. It'll be awesome. Don't make excuses for backsliding. Some people say, well, it's in my genes. I can't help it. I'm, our, our family are heathens. <laughs> it's in our genes. Well, then change genes. <laughs> Wash your genes. <laughs> the Bible says, though your, your genes be as red as scarlet, God can wash them white as snow. Though your, though your sin has just messed up your life, God can wash you and cleanse you. And actually, you have new genes because if you're born again and you have Christ in your life, then Jesus is your brother and God is your father. Come on. Man, you got a great family heritage. I think you're going to make it. I think you're going to succeed. I think it'll go well for you when you come from a family like that. I know a man, uh, Philip Cameron, he is from Scotland. He was from 20, over 20 generations of alcoholics, and God set him free. He got born again and is no longer alcoholic, doesn't drink alcohol, and is a minister of the gospel after 20 generations of alcoholism. Only God can do that. God can change those desires and even change you where you're no longer flesh conscious, but you're more spirit conscious, and it'll change your flesh. So don't pattern your life after ungodly people in your family. We all have those. Uh, don't focus on those who have fallen, but focus on Jesus. Again, so many times we look at the loss, and we've all had loss in our lives. And it can be depressing when you look at the loss or that that loss is constantly being brought up to your face. Don't focus on the loss. Focus on Jesus. And I'm telling you, you'll have so much joy. And the devil will say, what about that loss? And you say, what loss? I'm focused on Jesus. All I see is gain, gain, gain. <laughs> I'm gaining salvation, eternity. It's awesome. It's a great place to be. Get your mind off the loss. And, and I know some people, man, they just want to own it and marry it. And just, I'm going to live, I'm going to get it tattooed. I'm going to get my, my loss tattooed on me. I'm going to get my loss put on my, everywhere I look, I'm going to see my loss, my loss, my loss. No, get Jesus. If you're anything, I don't say go get tattoos. You obey God. You know, your body's a temple, by the way. If you graffiti it, you're going to have to talk to God about that. Not saying you can't or shouldn't, but talk to God because it's his building, right? We're his building. So if you do it, make sure God's cool with it. That's all I say. I have nothing to say about your building because it's God's building. So I'm not judging anybody. But talk to God about it first, just like I would. Lord, should I do this? Okay, yeah, it's been great. But talk to the Lord and, and, and focus, on the, focus on the gain, not the loss. Somebody is going to succeed, and it may as well be you. Number four, embrace correction and instruction as a child of God. Embrace instruction and correction as a child of God. 
That's another thing that saved my biscuits. For a long time, it seemed like I went through this phase, like I say, of that teenage spiritual uh, angst where all of a sudden I knew everything. You know, (laughs) it's like I've been serving the Lord for 10 years now and I know all there is to know. You can't tell me nothing. And it seemed like I was getting corrected, 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 corrected by my pastor, by the leaders, the church, all these things. And so it got to a point where daily I would just have to say, Lord, I receive your instruction. I receive your correction. I receive your instruction. I receive your correction. It's not my way. It's your way. And so we have to get to that place to where we don't think, okay, I know everything. You don't know anything. But, Lord, I receive your instruction. I can be corrected. It's important to be that way. I'm a man under authority. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here if I had not been a man under authority. And to say, okay, I understand if I've been wrong, help me to be right. How can I correct this? If you see something in my life, I receive that instruction. Because, again, the Bible says in Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Don't be upset or mad when someone corrects you. It says, Neither be weary of his correction, because God could be correcting you. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Okay? So, Dads, and we, we correct our kids because we love them, not because we hate them. If you're not being corrected, that's a problem because you're not being loved. And so you need that. We all do. Amen. If pastors get on you, it's because we love you. And if we're wrong, God will get on to us and we'll receive that as well because we're not perfect. Uh, there are two kinds of people, wax people and clay people. And wax people, whenever correction and instruction comes, their heart will melt and they'll get soft and they'll repent and they'll say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And their heart will get soft. Clay people, whenever instruction, the heat and the fire of correction comes, they'll get hard and they'll say, no, I'm mad, I'm bitter or whatever. And they can't take that correction or instruction. And that's a problem. Uh, when God spoke to Moses, he said, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. God gave Moses a word and it softened Moses' heart. But then that same word to Pharaoh, let my people go, hardened his heart. And he said, no, I will not. It's the same word that hardens one that softens another. The question is, what are you going to be? Wax-hearted or clay-hearted? Number five, save my biscuits. Don't get bored with God. It can happen again. Sometimes you get in a place where you say, oh, I've heard this before. You're not telling me anything I don't know, nothing I haven't heard a thousand times. <laughs> I go out on the streets and I preach to people and they say, I ask them, you know, did you know God loves you? Oh, honey, I've heard that a thousand times. I heard that all my life. I don't need to hear it from you. And I'm thinking, yes, you do because you haven't listened yet. <laughs> Obviously. I had this guy one time, I was preaching the gospel and asked him if he knew Jesus. And he said, I don't need that. I'm a blankety blank pastor. Oh. Like, what? A pastor cussing? I'm a blankety blank pastor. I don't need that gospel. <laughs> I'm like, yes, you do. Some people get this mentality. I preach that all the time, honey. You can't, again, you can't tell me anything you don't, I don't already know. Don't get bored with God to where everything's the same. You think, man, I've already experienced that. I want the deeper things of God. You can get so deep if you're not careful, you'll get stuck. And you, again, those shallow things, things as simple as I love you. Man, God loves you. You can get a revelation on that. It's the basics. Don't get so caught up with the awesome, cool, and I love that, honestly, I do. I love the deep things of God. I'm not saying, I don't mean to make light of those. I love the deep things of God. But at the same time, I can't forget sometimes those shallow things that new Christians can get a hold of, that they will be loving life, and here you are, you're so deep that you haven't smiled in over a year. I have an inward joy the world knows not of. It's like, yeah, you do. It's so in there, nobody's seen it. (laughs) Come on, let it out. 
People can just, again, Philippians 3, 1, Paul said, it doesn't bother me to write the same things to you that I've written before. In fact, it's for your own good. It'll help you, right? Repetition is good. Have you ever studied for a test and you were glad that you did because you passed it? It's important. You study and do it. Even if it's something you think doesn't even really matter. Oh, man, I've done that for so long. I had a friend, her name was Desi. She is one of the only people uh, that has gone through every branch of military service. She started out in the Marines, then she went into the Army, then went into the Air Force, then Coast Guard. And uh, it's, oh, Navy, first Navy and then Coast Guard. But anyway, she said when they were going into the Air Force, they gave her these tests, just a, pat, a stack of tests to everybody that was coming in as new cadets or whatever, and said, hey, here's your tests. You can take these. You don't have to if you don't want to. It's just extra. It doesn't have any bearing on where you're at or anything, but just if you want to. And so her being the kind of person she is, she said, I'm going to fill out every one of these and do my best. And so then after it was over, a lot of people just blew them off and didn't even do them. They came and said, okay, guys, by the way, uh, those test results uh, determine where you are in rank. Desi, you're in charge of the whole squad, the whole everybody. <laughs> She's like, what? Wow. She got promoted because she did what was boring and just kind of senseless and nonsense. But again, it showed the kind of person that she was. And uh, again, Revelations 2.25 says, but until I come, this is God talking, you must hold firmly to the teaching you have. I will give power over the nations to everyone who wins the victory and keeps on obeying me until the end. If you can hold on, this life is kind of like a job interview for eternity. How you do in this life is going to determine much of the next life. And I understand grace and mercy, and God will give grace and mercy to people that have done evil their whole life. They'll give their life to Christ. God will save them. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to put them in charge. I don't know. But he said he'll make those who stick with him to the end, he's going to make you rulers over the nations. I mean, I don't know. God could have some of you be uh, the, the king over Granberry. You might run Granberry. I don't know what it'll be or how it will be. There will be a millennium, a thousand-year reign where Jesus is on the earth, and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years with us. And so, again, what you do now is important, and it's important to stick with God and not get bored. Number six thing, another truth that saved my biscuits, trust God with the secret things. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. And there are times in life when you just don't understand what happened. Like, I don't know what happened there. Why did that person die? You know, how did this happen? I don't know. I just trust God with it. And they say, wait a second. So you're telling me this great man of God, person of God died of maybe some disease or they got sick or whatever? If God's real, how did he let that happen? And I've, you've probably heard this before, too, where people say, if, if God is real, why would does he let good things or bad things happen to good people? And I don't think I've heard, you've heard even this more uh, youth, youthful generation will say things like, well, I just can't believe in a God who would let people suffer and die. Well, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> God, why did you let them suffer and die? You know, one thing just maybe you might explain to people who don't understand. First of all, God gave authority to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he said, the earth is yours. I'm leasing it to you for a time. You have authority. You have power. Do whatever you want to. Be fruitful and multiply. Take care of it. Tend the garden, right? And so he gave them an earth lease. It still belongs to the Lord. And just so we're clear, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But, but he's leased it to man. And so then man, came, the devil came to man and said, hey, I'd like to get in on that lease. And Eve was like, okay, sign your name right here. And he signed in and now he's in authority and had power and he does things, but he only works through people to get what he wants done. And he has authority, but the lease is almost over. And when that lease is over, the devil's going to be off of it. 
right? And so anything the devil can do is through people. And so, yeah, there are bad things that happen in the earth, and God has to allow it because he cannot break his word with man. But again, he said there will come a time where it's going to come to an end. And Jesus said it's finished on the cross, When he died on the cross, he set everybody free so that you don't have to be in covenant relationship with the devil at all. But those that don't receive him are still in covenant relationship with the devil. And that's why people do demonic, devilish things. We're not subject to those old ways, but yet we still have them in our life. And sometimes, again, I can't explain why John the Baptist was beheaded. One of Jesus' best friends. God, if you're real, why didn't you save him? Jesus, why didn't you save him? Jesus said, it's a backwards kingdom. We don't do things like you do here. We don't see death as such a terrible thing. It's actually victory. The Bible says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. And man, John got a great crown, a martyr's crown. What a reward. It's like he ran for the prize and got the gold medal. You can't take that gold medal away from him. It's like, oh, so it wasn't a bad thing. James, Jesus' own physical brother, was beheaded. Again, they were tortured. Paul was beaten and whipped, and and they bound him. Agabus, one of the prophets in the New Testament, as, as Paul said, I have to go to Rome and preach the gospel in Rome, he said as a prophetic sign, took his belt and wrapped up Paul's arms and his legs, and he said, listen, if you go to Rome, this is how you're going. You're gonna be bound. And Paul said, oh, I know. He said, you're not telling me anything I don't know. He said, I'm ready to go bound. I'm ready to even give my life to Christ. He's like, oh, no, I know that. That's what, and Jesus said, for this cause I came. I came for this. I came to give my life for Christ, 100% of it, till the end. And if the devil kills me, I'll go with a smile on my face and say, your time is short. Because it's almost over. Amen. It's hard to get mad at God, and I would say don't get mad at God because God never makes a mistake. How can, how can I blame God for anything who is perfect? He's never done anything wrong. So, again, we love the Lord. We trust him. Truths that have saved my biscuits. The secret things belong to him. And there are some things I can tell you I don't know. Honestly, and it's okay to say that. Some people need an answer for everything. Well, you're a pastor. You should know why is this happening or why is that? I don't know. I trust God. Trust can only come when you don't understand or don't know what's going on. And we say, in God we trust, right? In God we trust. Do you really? Trust only happens when you don't understand or don't know. And that's when it really kicks in. So, this scripture has saved my biscuits many times. We're getting to the last point. Psalms 119, 165. It says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. Remember that. Great peace have they which love thy law. Do you love the word of God? I know I do. Well, then nothing will offend you. And so next time you're tempted to be offended by somebody and people will do things that will offend you, it's going to happen. Just say, no, great peace have they which love the law and nothing will offend me. I won't be offended. I have people come to me pretty regularly and they say, I am so sorry. And I say, what? They say, I'm so sorry I offended you. And I'm like, you did? And they're like, yes, when I said that the other day, I shouldn't have said that. I'm so sorry. And I say, I, I didn't even think a thing about it. It just, I didn't take offense of that at all. If anything, you were probably right. <laughs> but, but they, because I just try, I don't know. I just say, Lord, I'm not going to walk in offense if somebody doesn't shake my hand today. There's enough people here. I might not get around to shaking everybody's hand today or telling you hello or speak to you in your language. (laughs) If you speak Portuguese. I may not be able to personally contact every person. Don't get offended. 
You know, just trust, hey, somebody will get around to me or whatever. And it's the same way with me. If, if, something, if you do something, I'm not going to get offended because you didn't talk to me or whatever. I, I, I just have learned, don't do that. Because so many times you'll be mad at somebody for something and they, oh, they just had gas. <laughs> That's why they looked at you that way. <laughs> That'd be a little crude there. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody stepped on their toes. <laughs> and they were mad. And, they, and you just happened to catch eyes when they were like this. <laughs> there have been times, man, when I worship the Lord. I'm singing. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And I think I'm driving down the road. And I think, man, if somebody sees me, they're going to think I'm mad. But I'm not. I'm just passionate about the things of God. <laughs> you totally misread that. So again, don't get offended. Trust God. All right, so number one, serve God from a want to, not a have to. Number two, develop your own walk with God, not based on anybody else. Number three thing, don't make excuses for backsliding. Number four, embrace correction and instruction as a child of God. Number five, don't get bored with God. And then the sixth thing that saved my biscuits, trust God with the secret things. And the last one, the, this is a powerful one. This one we're transitioning into next week. Number seven, never underestimate the words and the power of the words, I'm sorry, I was wrong, will you forgive me? Never underestimate the power of those words. I'm sorry, I was wrong, will you forgive me? They work wonders, and it's amazing what it will do in your life. There have been times I was wrong. I was the one that blew it. And pride would say, I don't need to ask them to forgive me. But you know, you need to. Have the guts to leave the ruts and to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. This has helped in my marriage so much just to let her know I blew it. And I'm sorry, I was wrong. We all do, right? But, but if I never apologized, that would just stay there. And stay there and stay there. And so it's important to come back and to say, I'm sorry. Uh, Luke 15, 17, you know the story of the prodigal son. And if the band could go ahead and come on up, that'd be great. The story of the prodigal son, he ran away from the father. He left home. He said, okay, I'm going to do my own thing, live my life my own way. Who cares about anybody else? And his life went downhill fast. He found himself crashing and burning. In Luke 15, 17, it says, Finally, he came to his senses and he said, My father's workers have plenty to eat, and here I am starving to death. He said, I'll go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against God in heaven, and I've sinned against you. In other words, I'm going to go and say, Listen, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And you know the story of the prodigal son. The dad, when he came home, he said, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on his back, put shoes on his feet, kill the fatted calf. Let's have plenty to eat. It's going to be awesome. Let's celebrate and party because my son is home now. That's what you get for saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? If someone asks you that, please don't ever say, well, I'll think about it. And let me tell you why, because there's two people that he cannot forgive. God cannot forgive two people. One is the person that won't say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I repent. And the second one is anybody that won't forgive others. That's what the Bible says. I'll read it to you. In in Matthew 18, 32, it's a story. Jesus is telling about a guy who owed $20 million, 20 million bucks, a little different translation, but $20 million. And he goes to the king and says, I am so sorry I owe you $20 million. Will you please forgive me? And the king was going to have him arrested and sell everything, his family, his wife, his kids. And he said, I tell you what, I'm just going to let you go. You won't lose everything. I forgive you. The man was so happy. He walked out of that place, found a guy who owed him 20 bucks grabbed him by the throat and said, when are you going to pay me that 20 bucks? I'm going to have you arrested if you don't pay me now. Well, the king heard about that. One of the servants saw this and said, wait a second, that's that guy that got forgiven 20 million. 
calls the king. The king calls the man back in and says, and look what he says here. The king called the official back in Matthew 18, 32. And he said, you're an evil man. Wow, you are an evil person. When you begged for mercy, I said you did not have to pay back a cent. Don't you think you should show pity to someone else as I did to you? The king was so angry, he ordered the official to be tortured until he could pay back everything that he owed, the whole $20 million. Now, let me ask you this. How long do you think it would take to pay back $20 million when you're being tortured in prison? Never going to happen, is it? It's eternal. That's, and the, look at this, this next verse. Again, this is Jesus talking. In verse 35, he said, That is how my Father in heaven will treat you if you don't forgive each of my followers with all of your heart. According to Jesus, Christians who won't forgive are in the same boat as sinners who won't repent. Forgiveness is vital. It'll save your biscuits. <laughs> and again, we've got this next week, we're going to start our series on forgiveness. And I believe God's going to be doing some work on the inside of us. Let's all stand. He's going to be doing a little work on the inside of us all. And I know it might be a challenge. I don't know what you've been through, but some of you have been through stuff that is so hard. If I knew, I would say, I wouldn't forgive him either. But that's not what God says. You say, well, if you knew how I have been hurt, you would be mad too. And maybe so. But you know what? When you forgive people, it doesn't make what they did right, but it does make you free. It sets you free. Because you think you've got them in bondage behind bars of unforgiveness, but what you don't realize is you are behind bars of unforgiveness. You say, wow, well, I'm the one behind the bars. And when you set them free, wow. So I want everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes, search your heart. Ask yourself, is there anybody that I'm holding unforgiveness to? And I'll tell you how you can know whenever you think about them, you have that sinking feeling of, oh, I don't want to even think about them. I don't even want to see their face. You just see their face and it makes you mad or angry or that thought comes back up or that bill that you keep getting because of them <laughs> that you have to pay every month <laughs> or that thing that keeps, it's a reminder every week or whatever of your unforgiveness toward that person. I want to encourage you, release them and let them go forgive them in Jesus name and I just pray and I release every person here from any spirit of offense we command any uh, voice that's been speaking into your life from the devil even if it's another person that's been speaking into your life trying to hinder you or stop you from getting with God in Jesus name I bind that spirit and command them to go in Jesus name and I pray let every spirit of offense be gone from this place in this church you have no place here Lord I thank you we have a spirit of forgiveness so that we can be forgiven if you're here this morning you say I want to receive that maybe either you might want to get saved or say I'm sorry I was the one that was wrong I have repent I change if that's you I want to pray for you if you're here and you say no I'm not the one that needs forgiveness, I need to be the one to release forgiveness. I also want to pray for you because you're in the same boat. If you're here and want prayer on either of those two things, to come back to God, say, I'm sorry I was wrong, or I want to release forgiveness to somebody else, just lift your hand right now and say, pray for me. I see that hand. Thank you. Hands going up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Any over here in this section? Just lift it up. Wave it at me. Say, hey, I think I see that hand in the back. Seven, eight. Pray for me. I'm telling you, God's going to touch your life. There's a reason why you've been having the problems you've been having. It's that unforgiveness that has been stopping you. But wait till you get this out. I'm telling you, your life is going to be awesome. Oh, and I encourage you, 
bless those people that have done you wrong. That's the most amazing thing to do. <laughs> when you bless them, and when you think about them, you don't cuss at them anymore. You think about them, you say, Lord, I pray you bless them. God, help them. You say, wait, what? Why would I bless that? Why would I bless them? Because I'm free, and I don't, I'm not hurt by that anymore. I'm not, I choose not to walk around with open wounds anymore but I'm just letting God heal it right now. We had about eight, eight or nine people lift their hands. Let's pray this prayer together. Just pray it after me. Let's all pray it together with our hearts and lips out loud. Say, Father God. Come on, let's all pray it together. Say, Father God, I come to you based on your word. You said, if I would forgive, I would be forgiven. You said, if I would ask forgiveness, you would forgive me. So God, I ask you now to forgive me of all the bad that I've done. Forgive me for not doing all the good that I should have done. And God, I right now, as a faith act of my will, I forgive anyone who has done me wrong. God, I pray you've blessed them and bless me and help me to stay in forgiveness and not pick up that burden anymore from this day forward. I am free. I am forgiven. I am saved. And I'm on my way to heaven because I have Jesus Christ in my heart. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you, if you prayed that prayer from your heart and you just said, I do release forgiveness. The Bible says all your sins are forgiven. Again, set your sails toward God. Always run to Him. Don't run away from God. He loves you. He's got a great plan for your life. I encourage you, youth, come out Wednesday night right here. This is going to be a party. We're going to have this whole place transformed into Hawaii. It'll be awesome. And so, again, what time is that Wednesday? 7 o'clock. And then small groups start. If you have a small group, uh, get in one. If you don't, where can they get information for that? at Guest Central or on the website. Find a small group. Some of them go into the deeper things of God. And if that's where you can swim, swim in the deep end. Some of them are a little shallow. So if you're going to the shallow part and you say, hey, I don't like the deep yet, or I'm not, I like that, then we have a group for you as well. And there may be somebody, again, if we don't have a group for you, start one. We'd love to partner with you in that and start sending people to your group. Because I guarantee you, there's somebody that's right where you are and going through the same things you're going through. Amen? Well, let me pray a blessing over you. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and keep them. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you. And to, the Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. We'll see you next Sunday right here at 1045. Invite a friend. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We pray that you have been blessed by God's word. For more information, visit us online at heightslife.org.